All right, so today I want to talk about hypothesis testing. And again, I know you've gone over this in 2126, but feel free to ask any questions. While it is review, it's review probably at a somewhat deeper level than what uh, Dwayne does in 2126. So there's three things we need to say we have a causal relationship. And if you've taken 2127 or any other sort of typical research methods course, you know this. There are three important things, and I'll bring them all up at once here. We need temporal presence. Causes come before effects. That's how our universe works. Right? If the cause, yeah, the cause is x, and then the effect is y. x has to come before y. If there's a change in a variable, and then there's uh, the independent variable, and then you measure the dependent variable to see if you have a difference, right? one thing has to come before the other. X comes before y. Cause comes before effect. Don't get into some woo-woo quantum consciousness bullshit with me. It's just the cause of effect, okay? We have to eliminate alternative explanations. Right? This is sort of a classic thing that's dealt with a lot in behavioral sciences generally because especially when we're dealing with humans. It's a little easier with non-humans. Uh, I shouldn't say that, it's probably not. Uh, but there's some classic examples here, right? The idea of the Hawthorne effect, you know, Hawthorne Electric Works, industrial organizational psychology kind of stuff that was done geez, almost 100 years ago, where they were looking for more efficiencies from workers, right? Industrial organizational psychology, which is basically just the man's way of getting more out of the worker. Um, is that a little bit of a communist there? So they come in and they go to the Hawthorne Electric Works, which I think are in New Jersey, and they, they give people breaks. And productivity goes up. Yay, of course, of course it does. If people will break, find a break every hour, and then productivity goes up. They give them a 10 minute break. Productivity goes up. They change the lighting. They make it a little brighter in the factory. Productivity goes up. This all makes sense. Then they uh, eliminate breaks. Productivity goes up. And they make it darker. Productivity goes up. There's an alternative explanation here, which is they're being studied, and people, when they're, as people, when they're being studied, try to help. The demand characteristics of an experiment, oftentimes, I'll tell you something, maybe you participated in the intro psych experiments, and I don't know if you like, when I did it, the first thing I did when I was sitting with the the experiment is I think, what was this about? I wonder what they're really studying. And really, usually they're studying exactly what they tell you, but because you have in your mind that all psychology is deception, um, you think, what are they trying to do? Oh, I'll try to help them. I'll do the best I can. Or I won't try to help them. I'll try to screw with their results because I'm an asshole. Whatever. But that is an alternative explanation. You have to remove that. Now we can do that through design. Right? When I was in Western as an undergrad, you had to do five experiments in intro site. If you didn't, you failed. That's just how it worked. Good system. It was, you know, oh, chance to win a Tim Hortons gift card. It was like, you want to pass the course? Do five experiments. If you miss one, you have to do a makeup. I do 13 because I kept forgetting because I'm an idiot. So these two so far are about design. Covariation that as x changes, y changes. That's the thing we care about. That's what we can make decisions about statistically. So these first two are dealt with using proper experimental design. And this is true, really, when you look at elimination of alternative explanations, when you're doing an experiment. Doesn't matter if it's with, doesn't matter what kind of experiment, what kind of science you're doing, um, you want to have careful control. There's more care about controls and things on a macro level, I guess, in psychology and biology, for example, than there is maybe in physics. But they still care about those things. Right? Do you remember the oh a couple years ago when they sent they found uh, some part they, the transmission faster than the speed of light? It turned out they tried to do the experiment again and uh, all the equipment was wrong. <laughs> There's an alternative explanation. Fix the stuff and everything's fine. So we care about 
these things, but there's a whole other courses that teach you about that. When we talk about covariation, that's where we come in. That's where we as people interested in statistics. When I say we, I guess that's me. I'm interested in statistics. So here's some data that I made up that mean nothing. I don't know what they are, but those numbers are real. They're actual numbers. There are two groups. One has a mean of 66.2, one has a mean of 71.6, standard deviations of 7.85 and 8.56 respectively. Uh, what do we got, N of five, is that right? Yes, so five in each group. So the question now, let's assume we have two groups and we've, uh, how do we deal with alternative explanations, things like that? Well, we treat everything the same except we change what, they, what happened in group one and group two. We randomly assign subjects to groups, so we get, uh, this, the randomization makes, it's the best way to ensure is the wrong word. It's the best way to try to ensure that we have people who are the same in each group or rats or whatever. Right, so we've randomly assigned subjects to groups. We've then given them different treatments in group one and group two, so cause, and then here we have the effect. Good. So now it's the covariation. Now that's the, the, the piece of the puzzle we're trying to solve now is are the two groups different? So we have to see if they these two numbers are actually different. Okay. And I just use these because they work with the next thing I'm going to say. The numbers don't matter that much. I don't want you worrying about those numbers per se. Okay. So here's a distribution, a hypothetical distribution. This has a mean of 72 and a standard deviation of 8. Just move that over there, a little smaller. Here's the question. Could these two sets of scores come from the same distribution? So they're not, it's not because group one and group two are treated differently. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking a more basic question, and it's, let's pretend that the world looks like this in the, in the, in the distribution, the graph here. Could those two sets of scores reasonably come from those two distributions? Or from that distribution, I'm sorry. So we have one with a mean of 66-ish and one 71-ish, right? Let's take a look. Where's 66? It's about there. Yeah, that seems likely enough. 71, oh, geez. Just by me looking at it, and I can't even see that one, but just by me looking at it, I would say that there is a reasonable chance that those two batches of numbers, those two scores, both come from that distribution. I think that's a reasonable thing to say. Do you follow my reasoning? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, please. Is it because they both fall within? Like under the line? They're in the meaty part of the curve. Yeah. Is, is, is my feeling on this. Yeah. I mean, and we're, I'm doing this completely intuitively at this point. I'm not yeah. doing this based on any statistical technique. And I literally made up a distribution. I went on to a website and typed in uh, 72 for the mean and 8 for the standard deviation. And, I, and that came out and I copied and pasted it. So you don't, and then this is the thing, you don't ever know that when you're really doing statistics. You don't know what the real world is. Because like, if you did, you wouldn't do statistics. You wouldn't have to. You won't know the answer. So we never have this information. This is more of a thought experiment, I guess you'd say. We don't have this kind of information. Right? Because if one of the means was, I don't know, 32, that's not even, that's way over here. I mean, I would, I would say, no, it doesn't come from that distribution. It could, but the probability of that being the case is vanishingly small. Right? Because what we have on this axis, on the y-axis, is, I don't even know what that is. Probability? Yeah. It's how much, how likely a score is, basically. Just think of it that way. And when things are in this big, big <coughs> part of the curve, we think they're likely. It's like if I asked you about a coin, and I was to flip it 10 times. And we got 
Five heads. Everybody go, yeah, that's a fair coin. So put your hand up if I got six heads, which you think was a fair coin, out of ten. Six, six out of ten. Who said that's a fair coin? Yeah, I think that is a fair coin. Seven. You're still comfortable? I'm still comfortable. What about eight? It's getting a little harder, right? Nine? You think it's a fair coin? It's not like, right? Well, no, but it resets every time, right? So oh, yeah. 50-50 every time. 50-50 every time, but what's good. the probability of you getting nine heads? I'm not going to ask you the exact one. This is winning. Calculate, but don't worry about it. It's unlikely. And 10 out of 10, if I got 10 heads in a row, would you say, where'd you get the fixed coin? Could I have a fair coin that did that? Yes, of course I could. It's possible. <coughs> it's, uh, let's see, it times P, so that's 10. About point oh five times. Oh, that was magic. That lap. Out of a hundred. That's point oh five like probability, so five times out of a hundred that will happen. You're right, by the way, Dana. Thank you for saying that that it resets every time. That's an important thing to realize that when you roll dice, get a double sixes playing the back end. When you get double sixes, you don't go, well, I'm not going to get double sixes again. The probability of getting double sixes twice in a row is one thing, but that last roll has no bearing on the roll right now. This is what makes statistics hard, because it's independent events. Thinking probabilistically is hard. You know why there aren't any independent events in nature? We're basically, we've been selected. He goes into that loser theory, whatever he can. Uh, we, we've been selected for looking for dependent events. It's kept us alive. Oh, there was water there yesterday. Oh, there's water there. Going to probably be water there today. Oh, saber-toothed tigers hang out there. Probably should avoid that place. Right? Some guy on the savannah of Africa 200,000 years ago was like, wasn't like, well, it's probably independent events. Because <laughs> he's dead. Because there aren't independent events very often in nature. Nature doesn't work like that. That's what makes this hard. And convincing people that independent events even exist is bizarre. You ever have these discussions with people when someone's pregnant? Oh, it was the last one. It was a boy. Oh, this one will be a girl. Well, that's not at all how it works. I remember being actually at a dinner party and I was in graduate school and, and, and someone said that someone was pregnant. Oh, yeah, you're pregnant. That's great. Uh, what do you think the chances are? They think it would be a boy or a girl? I don't know. It's 50 50, I would imagine. What do you think? Well, yeah, but I mean, it, it. And I, I didn't want to go into it. There are really small effects, but, you know. And this one person said, well, I don't think it works that way. I said, but I know it works that way. And then I become this because I was in graduate school, so you, you, know, you think you know everything. Well, you don't, but you realize that there are certain things where you actually do know everything. It's a very small subset of things. And this guy said, no, I want to hear her version. I said, no, there's no her version of math. <laughs> my, my, and my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, was like, So it's hard to think that way, so I'm glad you brought that up. So you could get, you could do it a bunch of times, do a, uh, an infinite number of times doing flips of 10 times. At some point, though, if you keep getting 10 out of 10 all the time, you're going to have to fix going. So what I've just done is I've made a decision here, and I think you've all agreed that those two sets of scores could come from that distribution. Again, we don't tend to know that distribution in advance. If we did, we wouldn't have to do statistics. So, if the chance is relatively small, and it's, we've, we've, ran, we've not randomly, arbitrarily picked a number, 5%, um, then we say it's unlikely that it's happened by chance alone. And therefore, we have what we call a statistically significant effect. Without statistical significance, we, don't, we can't say that we have covariation of x and y. So we haven't met the third criteria for saying we have a causal relationship. So we either cry, or we redo the experiment, or we abandon our idea. <laughs> Usually just realize, oh, this is something wrong, let's try this again, whatever. OK, questions so far?
So if it's less than a 5% chance, we go, I don't think so. So what we do is we set up two mutually exclusive hypotheses. You guys know this. We have HO, the null hypothesis, or sometimes it's called uh, H0. When I was a student, before this was a term, we used to even say ho. We don't do that anymore because people take it the wrong way. Because I had a prof that, uh, my first stats prof called them ho and ha. Ha! The alternative hypothesis, or h sub 1, you'll see that too, that's fine. 1 says there is no effect, there is no difference. They come from the same population. The other one says, that's not true. <laughs> that's, that's all it says. They don't come from the same population. Okay. So we just set those up. H.O. is set up as a straw man uh, argument, if you think of this in sort of like classical sort of logical argument, right? It's something you're setting up to disprove. You're setting everything up to say that's not true. You don't actually believe it. Because if you actually believed that there was no difference between the groups, you actually wouldn't do the experiment to begin with. Right? Why would you do that experiment? What you tend to believe is HA. The cool thing is, the math doesn't care about what you believe. But the reasoning, right, it's like I said, straw man. You don't believe that to be true. That's bullshit. It's like when you set up a bullshit argument about with somebody. Oh, so you believe this, this, and this. That trick people do, when you, usually in comment sections. OK, questions so far? And I know you've ran into this stuff before, but don't feel bad if you want to ask questions. A lot of you haven't taken the stuff in a long time. Okay, good. So, we keep, we're going to make mistakes. The thing about this is we're actually going to make mistakes when we do this hypothesis test. Okay? There's two things here. There's what we do. We don't reject HO or we reject HO. Nowhere there does it say accept HA. It doesn't say that. It says reject HO or fail to reject or you know don't reject or whatever. This is our decision. Then there's reality, which we actually don't know. Because if we knew reality, we wouldn't have to do the experiment. If we knew how the universe worked perfectly, we wouldn't have to do that experiment. But in reality, it's the case that HO actually could be true. It could be that they both come from the same distribution those two sets of scores, or that there is no difference between the scores, which I just did the same thing two different ways. Or AJ could be true, that they are different. They come from different distributions, whatever. Okay. So, so you take a look at this. If we do not reject HO and HO is true, we have a correct decision. An example here where you do some test and there is a reality is a pregnancy test. You are pregnant or not. You can't be kind of pregnant. There's HO, you're not pregnant, or HA, you're pregnant. Right? HO, no baby. HA, you start saving for college fund. Do not reject HO. I, I don't know what pregnancy tests look like anymore. It's been very long time. They have I don't know. I don't know anything about it. You pee on them. I know that it's about, there's something about peeing. And then they either there's a line that shows up or something now? Yeah. Okay. There's, there's real digital ones. There's digital ones. That's digital ones and they actually sing. Wow. Like if you were pregnant. But do you tell them in But do you but do you tell them in advance I want a baby or not? Because like because if you want a baby, it's kind of easy. Yeah, you don't want to sexual Good. That's a that's a that's a that's a product we should all get together and market. <laughs> just yeah, just it's either somebody crying or a baby crying. Oh, and it would depend on. Oh, that's very. 
<laughs> Anybody listening on the internet, we're caught with this is now copyrighted. It's gold. So, not pregnant. Uh, the little line is at not pregnant. No little line. That's what I remember. No little line. That's right. There's a little line. I'm pregnant. Actually, you're not. Those things make mistakes. And if you look on the side, it will tell you the probability of making, in fact, it tells you the probability of making a type 1 error. It tells you the probability. At least they used to. I don't know if they still do it. Yeah, I, it's been a while. And there's no chance. There's literally, there's a, there's a vanishingly small chance of beginning to be pregnant since December 17th, 2003. No, yeah, 2003. There was a procedure that day. And I remember the day. Clearly, if not fondly. I need more anesthetic, I said. And the guy said, no, you don't. I said, doc. No, I won't tell you what I said. I can tell you, I'll, I'll can tell you when I'm not recording it, because it's, it's graphic. Um, so, it was along the lines of who's holding the scalpel and who's being scalpeled. So, that's a type 1 error. And we set that at 0.05. We wouldn't do that for pregnancy tests. We wouldn't want to be five, five times out of 100, one time out of 20. You know, I'm pregnant, you're not pregnant. That would not be a very good pregnancy test. No. Yeah, that would be like, that's pretty bad, right? And they're more like about 99.99 is the number you usually see. So that's 0.01. That's pretty good. Uh, sorry, 0 0.0001. So that's one time out of 10,000. That's pretty good. Now, it could be that we don't reject HO and HA is true. That's a type 2 error. That's a false positive. Those don't happen that often with those. They do happen, but again, they don't happen that often. I'm pregnant, or I'm not pregnant. Oh, but they, you're going to know. You'll find out eventually. That's a type 2 error. We typically don't know the, possible, the probability of this. The math isn't set up that way. It's different with pregnancy tests. They can figure some things out. Probably the false positive. So that's a type 2 error. This is bad, but it's not as bad as it's what you've, what's happened here is you've missed something that's there. So you've missed an effect. So there's an actual effect in the real world. When you're looking at uh, oh, I didn't find that. Do the experiment again, you find it. The worst thing that can happen here is someone scoops your research. The worst thing that can happen with a type 1 error, you publish it, is you look like an idiot. Hey, look, there's an effect, there's psychics. <laughs> no, there's not. And then finally, there's the thing we all want, which is when HA is true, and we reject HO. We've made a correct decision, and that's the correct decision we want. Okay. That's the one we want. That's our happy, correct decision. OK. We have some control in this situation as the experiment. We set the probability of a type 1 error. We say, how, what, where are we comfortable with when we make these false positives? And we set it at 0.05. The probability of a type 1, whoops, one, one error, is 0.05 usually. And that should, that should be equal, but usually it's equal to that. And that we call that alpha. The other way to say it is the probability of HO is true given we reject, sorry, screw that up, that we reject HO, given HO is true. That's alpha, okay? The probability that we reject HO, given HO is true. That's alpha, one point, uh, point oh 0.05, usually point oh 0.05. Alpha, right? I 
I just wrote that out. So the probability of a type 2 error, and this is called beta. This is the, the probability that HA is true, but we fail to reject HO. Depends on a lot of things. It depends on the number of observations. It depends on the variance of the standard deviation in the population, which we don't know. And it depends on alpha. Right? Because if we make alpha really small, what's going to happen? Well, make alpha small, make it like 0 0.0001, we're not going to have a lot of false positives. Or false negatives. Pardon me? I don't remember what that requires. Oh, alpha is the probability of a type 1 error, right? Yeah. And beta is the probability of a type 2 error. Okay, but it says the type 2 error depends on. Oh, yes. On n, which is the number of observations in your study. Okay. Right. And sigma, which is the standard deviation, or you could do sigma squared, the variance in the population that you're drawing from which is something you don't know. <coughs> and it depends on alpha, which is something you've set. You've set, but you don't have a whole lot of wiggle room, unfortunately. Stupidly. Ridiculous. Because we have this worship of the 0.05 level of significance. It's going away, which is great. But it's still there, believe me. One minus beta is, a, is the correct rejection given HA is true. That's called power. That's our statistical power. So we want that to be big. We want, and therefore, beta to be small. And we want alpha to be small. And we set up. So the key thing here, we'll have a whole lecture on power. Uh, may get probably next week, next. Is it Thursday? Probably. Um, power is something we want a lot of statistical power. We want to be able to detect something if it's there. But to detect something if it's there and not have a lot of false positives, those are competing things, aren't they? Because the decision we make depends on our false positive error type layer. We want that to we want that, that to be small. We want our power to be big, it depends on each other. So here's a question. What should we set alpha at? And we always say 0.05. Where does that come from? Um, that comes from R.A. Fisher. And we have two biology majors in the room. Who's R.A. Fisher? Tell me you know Fisher. He's the guy who came up with the first kid selection model of way before him. Back in the 30s. He was a bot, like a, I don't know what call a botanist. He's a population biologist, basically. And he also developed a little thing called analysis of variance. The F in F test is for Fisher. Yeah. And he had his graduate students working on doing the calculus to figure out the probabilities of getting different F values, which is doing it by hand, doing the calculus, doing the integral of the, of the different degrees of freedom for the F uh, distribution. Wow, a lot of work. Now, he contacted, I think it was a two, no, it was Frank Yates in the States. And he did this probably by mail because there wasn't any email back then. And asked him, because he was also working, what probability uh, level are your students calculated? And, and Yates replied 0.05. And she went, okay, and that's what we get 0.05 from. It's two guys making an arbitrary decision. That five times out of 100 is, 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 we'll take that as our level for our type one error. That's completely where it comes from. It's completely arbitrary. And it's because one guy said, what are your students working on? We should collaborate on this because we'll get this to be probability of distribution these tables that more quickly than other researchers. 0.05, 0.05, we'll do that then too. 
That's where it comes from. There's not any wonderful explanation other than arbitrariness. So the reason we get all worked up about 0.05 is because two guys thought it was a good number. <laughs> they could have said 0.04, they could have said 0.06, but for some reason humans like fives and zeros. They eventually also did 0 0.01, 0.1, and others. So it's solely because of Fisher and, and, and Yates. We might want to be a little more flexible. Think about who, where's an example where you, you don't care about making false positives? Give me an example. People, where it's like false positives are not that big a deal because of something's there we want to detect. It. Like what? You want, but do you, want, do you want to tell people they have cancer? If they don't, yeah. I've heard that and that makes some sense, but you want them to do the test again. Yeah. Which you typically do anyway, but Sean the other day. Where was the cancer treatment? Was it along those lines? Think about public health. Oh, I'll say like a flu shot works. Sure. Flu shot works about 70% of the time. It's not bad. It's not a bad example. What's another? Like 70% of people actually get the immunity typically to the, to the flu shot each year. But 30% of people with the shot, it doesn't really work. What about testing water for boil water or something like that? Anybody here ever lived anywhere where there's a boil water on your water? Because I lived in Newfoundland. And that was how the world worked. And every spring, there'd be runoff. And there's a possibility of getting Giardia. Do you know what Giardia is? Yes. Fever, fever. It's exceedingly unpleasant. And if you're a baby, or if you're a, a, an old person, you might literally have diarrhea to death. Or you can convenience me. So that's the possibility of the type 2, not type 2 error, yeah, type 2 error of missing something that's actually there, is, oh, some people have to boil their water. Be sure to boil your water for 20 minutes before you use the water. Or, so that's, I don't know, that's a little inconvenience to people. I know people would always complain about this when I look at Newfoundland. They'd say, I can't believe there's not a boil order. Nor Jesus by it. And they'd say, yeah, but, you know, if they miss this, somebody's going to die. And the inconvenience to you to have to boil some water. You know, so you can have a cup of coffee or a of tea. It's not that big a deal to brush your teeth. Just close your mouth when you're bathing, you'll be fine. Right? Actually, you know, secondhand smoke research, it's never reached 0.05. Never. It's not 0.07. But, you know, inconveniencing some people say, you know what, you have to go outside and they gross thing you do, go do it over there. It's better than saying, there's a chance, it's not, it's 0.1, 0.05, it doesn't matter. We wouldn't do that, it's what society is determined is. You know, there's a pretty decent chance that, uh, it's a reasonable guess that just secondhand smoke's really bad for you. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna say, no, 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 smoke inside. No smoke outside. You want to your own house, whatever you want. Right? By the way, the way you solve the boil order thing is, once you lived in Newfoundland, you long enough, you just get a filtration system on your own water and you don't worry anymore. Which is a good idea. It's like 200 bucks to install these change the filters every couple months. Nonetheless. So those are those are situations where we're gonna say, yeah, look, 0.05, screw that. How about 0.15? That's one standard deviation. One, six actually. One standard deviation is, and that was in fact what they were using uh, for the oil order test. It was one standard deviation away from the neighborhood. There's a whole lot of part of the curve left, but you know, frankly, yeah, okay, I'm okay with, with not shitting myself to death. I'm cool with that. I don't want that happening. That seems unpleasant. Okay? Where would you go the other way? Where would you be really conservative and say go to 0.005? Yeah, go ahead, John. How about particle research? Like what? This is good. So. Does a graviton or something exist? If I took a yep. hundred 
like quintillion particles is one of them in there. Yeah, that kind of thing. Because is that going to blow the lid off of a whole lot of ways we think about physics? Uh huh. So if something's going to blow the lid off the way we thought about a lot of things, that's what you want to do. So if, here's one. What about, uh, well, anything like that? Like, that says all the world predicts this should happen? How about all of evolutionary theory, this modern synthetic evolutionary theory, says this will happen? And I'm going to try to do an experiment to show that that isn't the effect here, that something else should happen. You better be damn sure you're right. Here's another one. What about saying there is ESP? You better be damn sure that's true. Because you're about to make an idiot of yourself in print. I found ESP. No, you didn't. <laughs> Do the experiment again. Yeah, I know you got 0.04. There you go. <coughs> How great this. Can you try that again, please? Right? And in fact, any good scientist, would, if they found that, would go, whoa, that's weird. Let's do it again, Ted, because I don't want to make a fool of myself. And then what you do is you go back and look at your experimental design and say, there's something else going on here because people aren't psychic. This is weird. The problem is, of course, there are a lot of people in the world who will reply to authors of articles when they have an effect at that 0 0.0504. Because the author is honest and reported the PDAP, but said, this fits with all the other with the pattern of, of the results I have and all the sort of theoretical framework I've outlined in this paper, so I'm going to talk about this. And I was told by the editor, do not discuss non-significant effects. And I didn't get angry. Well, I was angry, but I didn't get angry back in an email back because um, I was uh, I was in graduate school, probably still. Yeah, when you're in grad, you don't go. I'm going to burn all my bridges right now. You don't do that. It's like okay, I'll just leave that there, and people will see it. And this is what I hope. This is in fact what happened. People would see it and go, oh yeah, okay, okay, makes sense. It's like I could have run one more day, and it would have worked. More in, right? But you don't do it that way. More and more people are now reporting exact p values and making stronger claims the smaller the p value they get, the, pro the smaller the probability they have in their results of getting a type one error. That's becoming a much more common approach. And if you have a sympathetic editor of a journal, they're really into that. Like if everything is, uh, you know, at point one, let's say, but it all fits the pattern, I'm fine with that. I just reviewed a paper li literally last week for a journal where they had point of, point of, less than 0 0.05 for a whole bunch of things, and they had two results that were 0 0.06 and 0 0.07. And I wrote my review, you know, just, you should just talk about that anyway and just say, look, it fits with everything else I predicted in my introduction. My, everything else is fine. Um, I'm just going to talk about this. And it's funny because I was with the reviewers, and then the editor of the journal said, well, he replied to me, he said, no, I don't take that approach, but I see what you're saying, so I'm just going to leave that comment there, and they can do whatever they want. So it's becoming more common that people talk about exact p values rather than talking about 0.05, significant, not 0.05, not significant, commit seppuku. So the other thing to keep in mind is statistical significance doesn't mean practical significance. Those are two different things. So if something is statistically significant, we hit the magical 0.05 level, we're happy. We can discuss it. But does it actually matter? If you measure enough stuff, and let's use people because it's easy, enough characteristics of people, you will find some effect. You'll find correlations that are at the 0.05 level of significance in, I don't know, probably the size of your little toe and your score on some aggression level question. I bet you would. But you have to measure 35,000 people, give them the test, and then measure the little toes. 
Does that actually matter? Probably not. So it can be statistically significant or practically not significant at all. It doesn't matter. Right? There's a very interesting, for example, uh, effect that happens. There's a really interesting sex difference between men and women um, where you have, in spatial reasoning, where if you, this is a neat experiment, by the way. And it fits beautifully with this because even scientifically it's interesting, but practically it's meaningless. So if you give people a line drawing, it looks like this. And you say, draw with, assuming this is down, that's up, that's left, that's right, this is a cup. Draw in the line where the, where the liquid would be. And everybody gets that right. Now you do it sideways. And you say, draw in the line the way the liquid would be. And of course, you know, it's like this, except 30% of women do that. Does that matter? No. Women aren't walking around going, I don't understand where that's from. It's practically meaningless. It's, it, it, it's actually scientifically makes some sense with ideas about spatial reasoning. It's very cool. It's a very cool result. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't trust women to be, I don't know, to carry glasses of water because they might be going, I don't understand. <laughs> right? And there's similar results like this with men detecting uh, really simple misspellings. Right? We don't say, well, we shouldn't teach men to speak because obviously they're idiots. <laughs> right? <laughs> we just say, look, well, okay, so that makes some sense because of the effects of hormones and behavior, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't actually matter in the real world. It's theoretically interesting and useful. So something can even be theoretically interesting and useful, but but scientifically, uh, sorry, but practically meaningless. Right? I've talked to a lot of guys who behavior with me, the idea of uh, effects of a menstrual cycle on, on, on spatial reasoning in women, and that doesn't mean that women shouldn't drive when they're having their period. <laughs> Right? It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean like, oh, I'm sorry, officer, I got lost because I have, I'm having my period and I have no spatial skills. I'm going to use that next time. <laughs> See, that doesn't work. Who wants to listen to Elizabeth Hampson's research? She's getting through that. See how that works. Also, you know, I've said this before, it's, that's not an excuse for guys to say you really, you shouldn't be driving because uh, your spatial skills are way down right now. No, in a very specific sense, yes, they are. But you know what? Practically, it doesn't matter. So we have to think about that too. It can be scientifically even interesting, like this is, or like these other results we're talking about, but in the real world they're uninteresting. Right? So it's something to think about whenever you, this is sort of the social responsibility of a scientist. And this is, I think, more true in psychology than almost any other situation, sometimes with nutrition stuff too. Um, where people will look at results that are done in a lab that makes sense with theory and everything, and they'll try to apply it to their daily life. And this is why you have to be very careful when you communicate science to people. To the general public, not to the scientists, we're all fine, we get it. But when the, when the popular media picks it up and says that, oh, I don't know. Something causes cancer because everything causes cancer. Oh, baby causes cancer. Yeah, it probably does. But the amount you have to eat is so large that no one would ever do that. For example, those kind of things. Right? So it's annoying to put things like that in disclaimers like that in a paper or in a, and in fact, you might have an editor go, yeah, this is a But yeah, and, and, then, and then CBC picks it up, and then some half witted reporter, I shouldn't say that, but that's what I mean. Um, <laughs> you guys know about science, we're a science reporter, it's horrible. And not all of them like that. There are some great science reporters out there. Bob McDonald, who works at Quarks, is amazing. He gets things, he understands things, he understands science. A lot of people who do science stuff don't. You know, like, for example, for a very brief period after people play violent video games, they score more higher, they score higher on aggression scales than people who have not just played violent video games. For about 10 minutes, so it's a real effect, and it's not surprising. It's also completely society really doesn't matter. Right? It's like, oh, it's the video games. Then they play everything on video games, right? So you gotta think about that. Practical significance and statistical significance are two different things. All right, questions? Good, have a good weekend.